Friends, I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday evening service, taking the place of our weekly cross training for our Latin services. Today, it'll just be me speaking to you here in the sanctuary of Zion Blue Mountain United Church of Christ, a congregation which has weathered and stood and lived a life of abundance of God's blessings since 1739, over 280 years. And we too shall come through this time knowing God's grace and full abundance of their love. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. These words are familiar to many of us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me. Heard in both song and prayer, if you haven't heard them before, I hope that you look into them now. They are taken from Psalm 51. At least a portion of them are. I'd like to speak to you about something I hear people speaking in these times, and I want to acknowledge that this order of service I have taken and adapted from one I watched recently from United Church of Chapel Hill, who has wonderful leadership, a place I once worshipped with during a workshop, and so I wish them well and thank them for a, their example, a reminder to me of the symbols which I'm about to present to you today. But in our ancient scriptures, we hear about plagues and disasters. In our history books, we read about them as well. They occur still in our world. Throughout history and time, we've often blamed these on God when it has nothing to do with God at all. These are not sent by God, though we may have thought or reconciled them in our minds through writings of ancient uh, liturgists who considered that they may be. But I know a God, a God who is a God of abundant grace, a God who is a God of love, a God who came to us in the form of one of us, Jesus Christ, and who walked and suffered among us so that we could be cleansed and forgiven for all our sins. Friends, that doesn't sound to me like a God who would send a plague or a virus or earthquakes or tornadoes among us. We need God in those times, and we have often in ancient times not known how to reconcile those events, and so we write about God through them. Now, that's not to take away or neglect the many interesting conversations we could be having around those things in Scripture. And I'm sure many folks would find fault with what I'm saying, and perhaps even I would upon examination later, but I want you to know this, that COVID-19 or the coronavirus, whatever you may be calling it, is not sent by God. It has existed among animals, as many viruses do, and it's sometimes mutated so that it can be transferred from animals to humans and now from humans between each other and so forth. It's a virus, as many other viruses exist, but this is a very dangerous one in the way that it can mutate and in the strain that it may put upon our medical system. And so we must consider God in this time. How does God show us that we should be caring for one another and for ourselves and for this world? In these times, we often repent of our sins, and we think, Oh, God, why have you done this to us? What have we done wrong? I don't believe that God has sent this to us, as I've said, and it's certainly not because we've done stuff wrong, but I do believe we are doing some things wrong, and these are moments in our course of human history that we can consider our sins, and we should confess them and repent from them. Knowing God's abundant grace and love for us. We can, should consider how we are conducting ourselves in this time and how we will change through it and become a new thing after it. For God is always doing a new thing. This can and should be a moment of confession in our lives at times as much as it is a moment of loving our neighbors as well. Confession for those who are gluttons in this time. For those who seek to profit from folks rather than take precautions and preventions and protect others. 
for those who ridicule people making difficult decisions in order to protect loved ones and neighbors and communities. It's a time of confession for many things. I'd like to read to you Psalm 51, which I mentioned earlier. A psalm often thought of in confession time. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty. A sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give you a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in the right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. In this time of confession, I'd like to share with you my own personal confessions, things where I know I have gone wrong or astray or given into fear. And that is probably my first confession. Though I do not consider myself a fearful person, one who listens to God's words to not be fearful all the time, there are times in this time in our history where I have felt anxious, where I have given into fear a little bit, where I have worried maybe a little bit too much. There's a lot to think about when you're a pastor. There's a lot to think about when you're a parent. There's a lot to think about when you're a community member in these times. And so I have given into fear when I should have relied on hope at times. And I encourage you to stay with me in the hope as long as we can, but to know that when you give in to fear, God's grace is there to lift you to hope. I have been short at times of those who I value the most, dealing with the stresses of these times in our church world and discovering new ways and trying to change plans. You often sometimes go home at night and then get frustrated over the small things, as maybe you do from a long day at work. And I have at times been short with my own child when I should not have been. I've also not given in to listening to her as much as I should have in her disappointments in the world in this senior year for her in high school. And so I've tried to listen better when I knew that I fell short. When I thought that the world's problems were the only thing for me to worry about, and I neglected that her problems were for me to worry about as well, if not first and foremost. And so for those and for many other of my sins, I ask forgiveness not only of those who I have committed them against, but especially to God. I would like to take and give you a moment of time alone in silence where you are watching this to confess your own sins.
Friends, as we hear those waters being poured out, I want to assure you that through the waters of our baptisms, through the sacrifices of Christ, your sins are forgiven. And there are promises and assurances made to us. I want to share them with you through an affirmation of faith from my book called Common Prayer, a liturgy for ordinary radicals, written by Shane Claiborne and Jonathan Wilson Harper. Lord, you have always given bread for the coming day, and though I am poor today, I believe. Lord, you have always given strength for the coming day, and though I am weak today, I believe. Lord, you have always given peace for the coming day, and though of ancient, anxious heart today, I believe. Lord, you have always kept me safe in trials. And now, tried as I am today, I believe. Lord, you have always marked the road for the coming day, and though it may be hidden, today I believe. Lord, you have always lightened the darkness of mine, this darkness of mine, and though the night is here, today I believe. Lord, you have always spoken when time was ripe, and though you be silent, today I believe. Amen. Friends, I have before me ashes used in our Ash Wednesday services and our ashes to go here. They are made of, of palms from previous year's palms that are burning. Ashes are used as a symbol throughout Scripture and in our times, reminding us of our own mortality and also as a symbol of repentance. And so these ashes remind us that life in our own selves can be dirty at times. That we are made in God's image, but we are here on this earth made of soil and it's not always clean. We don't always have a clean heart. And yet we have ways to wash ourselves of those things in our life. And we have the waters of our baptism with the assistance of a, a little foaming soap as well. Maybe you didn't know the history of soap. It was come, it's legends or myths, or not legends. Uh, lore has it that soap was brought to us out of religious ceremony in the past. And originally soap and many other products, including old toothpaste made with ashes in it. And so in these waters of baptism, we can let go of our sins, we can ask for forgiveness, we can know that we are made clean through Christ. And sometimes it takes a little extra scrubbing as well. We are reminded of God's enduring grace, love, and forgiveness in this act. That for as long as we wash our hands, for as long as we live for eternity, God has washed away our sins and forgiven us through the sacrifice of Christ. And through the promises of the empty tomb of Easter, God has created a new and a right spirit within us. This is my hope and prayer that as we come through this time and we head towards Easter, whenever that may be in our lives, not just on the calendar, but when we come out of this tomb, when we are renewed in the light, that we will know that God has created a new and a right spirit within us. Amen. Um,